Hi, this is Guy Wallace, and I'd like to talk to you today about performance improvement at four levels, beyond, but including, instruction. What's key here is analysis, analysis at all four levels, of the performance competence requirements. Performance competence is, as the graphic says, the ability to perform tasks to produce outputs to stakeholder requirements. You've got to know all three elements. What are the outputs that are being produced? What are the tasks performed to produce those outputs? And what do the stakeholders require regarding both the outputs and the process tasks? The four levels refer to something that Roger Addison uh, coined, and that is at the first level there's the worker, and then at the second level there's the work itself. Third, the workplace, and fourth, the world. This is also known as individual and process and organizational performance. And then the world is a new element, not considered too often by many. But if your company is involved or interested in social responsibility, then you need to consider this as well. Your enterprise is part of a vast value chain that involves many, many others and affects many people as well. This is my adaptation of the Ishikawa diagram, and it's been merged with some elements of Tom Gilbert's behavior engineering model. As we said, performance competence is the ability to perform tasks to produce worthy outputs to the stakeholder requirements. And what makes an output worthy, borrowing Tom Gilbert's phrase, worthy outputs, is that it meets the stakeholder requirements and once it meets the stakeholder requirements, those are the outcomes that many people talk about. Outcomes were always too fuzzy for me. I wanted to know what the tangible, physical, kickable outputs were that are produced. And if it's not exactly tangible or kickable, such as a decision, it can be made tangible. It can be written down. And I wanted to have that kind of clarity in terms of why are people performing tasks and employing certain behaviors What's the output that they're striving for? The enablers of performance competence include both environmental asset that enable the performance, the process, and also human asset that enable the performance and the process. We'll take a closer look at each of these on the spines of my adaptation of the Ishikawa diagram in just a moment. A word of warning, caution, or a recommendation. Regarding my language and labels, one should always adopt what you can and adapt the rest. Fit what I present here into the language of your customers, your clients, your enterprise. There's no need to make them learn our language, or my language, convert it. Now processes are messy, and I always like to think of outputs of a process as inputs downstream. So outputs as inputs is a key factor here in how I like to look at performance, and if we don't understand the input and the requirements downstream for those inputs, our output will never meet those requirements and the receiving systems downstream are one of the stakeholders. Now processes are messy and they are also mostly informal and unnamed and that's an issue and that's something that we all have to contend with. People work in these processes but they don't always uh, acknowledge or are cognizant of what's this one called. Uh, they're just doing their work. Now I borrow a lot from this model, which was uh, published by me back in the late 90s, uh, some work uh, that Gary Rumler, the late Gary Rumler, and Dale Brethauer had done. They had published this article in one of my quarterly newsletters. And you'll see that there's five components here to their version of a process. There's the receiving system downstream there on the right, and then there's the output as an input, as I like to call them, uh, going into that receiving system. And then there's the processing system that generates that output through 
tasks and steps or whatever language you want to use to describe that. Then there are uh, inputs into that process, outputs from upstream, inputs to the process that we're looking at. And then there's the feedback systems, which also includes consequences. Consequences being part of a feedback. Now, I like to organize processes when I'm thinking about an organization department level, if you will, in this model, and I organize all the processes into the boxes in this model here, which are in four tiers. There's the leadership tier, the core tier, and these are management responsibilities or individual contributor responsibilities, but at the core, management is looking at the individual processes that their people perform that are owned by the department but sometimes their people are loaned out to other departments to work in somebody else's process such as when engineers are assigned to work on a sales effort sales owns that process engineers support it and then at the bottom tier of the of the box at the top is our support processes uh, we're not going to look at that in any great detail in this video um, I, that subject uh, I've covered in other videos and you can take a look at that by looking for the management areas of performance. I have books on that, I've got blog posts on that, and there's other videos that cover that in particular. But that's one way to begin to look at uh, processes at a department level. Now if you look at an organization itself, the enterprise, in an org chart fashion, you can decompose every function every organizational entity on the org chart into these this look at a department level or whatever it might that might be called teams functions etc but it, they're all uh, working on processes processes that they themselves own and control and other processes that are owned elsewhere by somebody else if uh, the sales organization is doing their annual expense budgets well, that's a process that's most likely owned by the finance organization, but sales and everybody else needs to do it the way that the finance organization has laid that out. So again, we can, we can decompose at a department level to look at all the processes and those that are leadership in nature, core, the things that make that department unique from other departments, and support. And the leadership and support processes are most often, not always, owned by somebody else and the process itself and any training regarding that process can be highly shared across the rest of the organizations. But the things that are core to a department are unique to a department, more or less, and therefore the training or the performance support that's provided to the people in that department, that might be quite unique and not as shareable uh, as um, the other two tiers in this particular model. Now again, gaps in targeted processes, if we analyze a process and we find gaps, uh, those gaps are probably due to other variables. Uh, it could be the process itself, or it could be those uh, environmental enablers, or it could be the human enablers. However, my mentors, formal mentors, direct mentors, and uh, informal and indirect mentors, uh, such as the late Gary A. Rumler and Walt, uh, W. Edwards Deming, uh, both talked about problems, um, opportunities in uh, the enterprise, and that most problems uh, are not the cause of individual contributors. They're due to what Deming called the system. Um, and both of those two uh, gurus, if you will, talked about that uh, we shouldn't be blaming or seeking to blame or pin the blame on the individual contributors. The reason we have problems are due to the system, and that's in the control of management. So it's something that management needs to step up to. However, there's other functions within a modern enterprise um, that are in place to support the core processes and really all of the processes across the entire enterprise, and they may be deficient. That may be the root, where the root causes exist, and those things need to be attended to at their source. 
Um, this is just another view of that. There's the blue box in the middle. That's the process that we're focusing on, or processes that we're focusing on. And then there's the green boxes, and these are the enabling asset management systems that are human in nature when they're in green, and red, they're environmental asset enabling management systems. So there are systems in the organization that provide data to the process. They provide people that are trained to the process as but two examples of this model. And again, we'll look at that a little bit closer in just a minute. Again, this all goes back to this idea of performance competence is in a performance context. And that context makes available certain assets, people and things, humans and environmental assets, that either are conducive to the needs of the process or they're deficient. And that's what we've got to look for. Now when I'm doing performance analysis, which is always a part of my instructional systems design methodologies, uh, I, because that's what I do for a living. I'm an instructional systems designer, a instructional architect, but before I'm an instructional architect, I'm a performance analyst. And this is the device that I use when I'm meeting with groups of people, master performers and other subject matter experts, and using a facilitated group process to pin down what is the performance that we're really focusing on. And I use the same device and gather the same kind of data if I have to go the more traditional route of individual interviews and observations and document reviews. But the performance model is at the heart of my analysis methodologies. And here's an example of uh, that was uh, from the mid 80s that I've kind of generalized a little bit to uh, uh, not uh, share any of my clients' secrets, all of this didn't have any secrets in it. But what we're looking at is we're looking at what are the key outputs for a chunk of the business, of the process. So if we think of Addy, you may not like Addy, but Addy has analysis, design, development, implementation, and evaluation. If we were to look at one of those chunks, we might want to know, so what are the key outputs produced when we're looking at that one chunk? It's a work breakdown structure approach, if you will, if you're familiar with that. So we want to know what the outputs are and what are the key measures. Simply, how do we know a good one from a bad one? And we want to pin that down and because that's the focus. Begin with the end in mind. What is the output? Then we can begin to look at well, what are the key tasks that are performed to produce that output. And there's a middle column there that I'm not going to talk about, but that's, you know, who does what? What are the roles and responsibilities? Is there individual contributor, the managers, the directors, the vice presidents? What? Uh, other players from other departments, as I talked about a little bit earlier. But after that, we want to really focus on, well, what are the typical performance gaps? And we do that by looking back at the outputs and those key measures, and we ask master performers, for those people who aren't master performers, where are they missing the boat, so to speak? Where are their outputs not meeting the key measures? And they can tell us that because master performers, in my experience, and I've been doing this since 1982 as a consultant and before that as an internal consultant at two different companies, master performers generally know why other people are not uh, master performers, why they're struggling, what their points of failure are. Um, and so I want to understand, well, what are the typical performance gaps? I don't want to know everything under the sun. I don't want to know what things happen, you know, every third blue moon. I want to know what are the typical prevailing gaps in the outputs as evidenced by the non-master performers. Where are they struggling? And then I want to understand, well, what are the probable causes? Now, I understand quite completely that even if I can get a consensus from a group of master performers as to what the probable cause is, it doesn't make them right. Uh, but who else would you ask? So it's a starting point for us to understand what are the ideal performance on the left and on the right hand side of this chart, well what are the typical gaps and the probable causes for those? And then in the final column, way over on the right there, it, uh, there what are the, those probable causes are attributable to deficiency in the environment, which are attributed to deficiency of people's knowledge and skills, or what are the causes that are attributable to deficiencies in people's attributes and values. And I look at three different attributes and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. So 
So that's the performance model. I can capture ideal performance on the left and a gap analysis on the right. I've been using this model since 1979. It looked differently uh, in 1979, but it pretty much stabilized and began to look like this in the early 80s. And this is a part of my curriculum architecture design methodology and my version of an addy like uh, content development, instructional content development model, MCD, Modular Curriculum Development and Acquisition. I'm big into reusing content that the shareholders have already paid for and trying to use that either as is or after modification uh, and salvage those prior investments and get some reuse out of them. So the first thing that we want to look at is, you know, what's the process? What's the performance? And that's what the big green box on the left there is trying to portray is that's the process, performance competence, the ability to perform tasks to produce outputs to the stakeholder requirements. And that's what we're always going to be focused on. And so the variables of process performance, quite frankly, is the process itself. And it's been designed to generate the outputs that are inputs downstream and that meet the stakeholder requirements in the process itself and the outputs that are produced. We need to start there. That's something I learned from Deming and from Rumler and from many, many others uh, who have mentored and guided me along my professional development path. Uh, at the bottom of this, uh, the spine there, the adaptation of the Ishikawa diagram, are the environmental enablers. And so I was taught by Rumler and indirectly by Deming to look at the environmental enablers second before I begin to look at the human uh, assets that enable. And so those include uh, uh, these variables here, and we'll cover those. The, that's data and information. And so is, th is the process being fed the right data and information? Uh, is it being fed the right materials and supplies? Uh, are the right tools and equipment in place and available to meet the needs of the process? Are the facilities and grounds that are available conducive to the needs of the process? Is the budget overall and the headcount budget in particular sufficient to meet the needs of the process? And very importantly, is the culture and the consequence system conducive to the needs of the process? And one of the things that I learned from the late Gary Rumler is that culture is the consequence system. It's what's uh, expected and then reinforced or extinguished and the culture is a reflection of the consequence system and I, I truly believe that. But I uh, don't believe that any enterprise has but one culture. I think cultures exist at more of a departmental level or a team level within a department depending on how that's all structured and organized. So there's most often many different cultures. Uh, we may have bad apple managers, if you will, uh, that have created a poor culture in their organizational unit, the one that they run, and we may have many problems with the performance there and with the people and their attitudes because they've been affected by a bad culture. The next department over might have a great culture where the manager is clear about their expectations and provides feedback, corrective and reinforcing feedback, but does all of that in a non-punishing, non-threatening way and really helps people develop to meet the needs of the organization, to meet the people's needs to grow and develop. Uh, at the top of the Ishikawa diagram adaptation that I made are the human elements and those include do people have the awareness, knowledge, and skills that are required? Um, new hires uh, don't know what they need to know and don't know uh, relative to the needs of the process so a training request for new hires should be expected whereas a training request for problem solving is something that probably should be suspected. But we shouldn't be trying to answer all of the organizational's uh, uh, problems and issues with more instructional content, more training content, more learning content. That's most often just a waste, a squandering of shareholder equity. 
and that's no good. Uh, do the people have the physical attributes that are required? Do they have the stamina and strength if that's what's required in the job? Not all jobs require that, but some do. What are the psychological attributes? I mean, if you're going to be in sales, can you take rejection? If on average you're going to make a sale on after every 27 sales calls, can you withstand the punishment of 26 failed sales calls before you make a hit? And of course, if that's an average, you could have hundreds of sales calls before you actually make a sale. And is the person, the people, psychologically disposed to exist in that kind of environment? That's not for everybody. And it's the, we could have a situation here where we've misselected people and probably trained them then. And they're just, their personalities are not conducive to the needs of the process, to the realities of the process. And that's going to be a big issue. Uh, intellectually, are, do they have the right attributes? If we need people to do strategic planning and they are concrete thinkers and not conceptual thinkers, well, that could be a problem. And that's just but one example. Now, so there's all these systems in place to help provision the right stuff, the environmental assets, and the right people with the right knowledge and skills, attributes and values um, to the needs of the process. Um, again, we need to start with, is the process design itself conducive to meet the needs of all the stakeholders? downstream stakeholder receiving systems is your output a worthy input from their perspective you got to start there so we also have to look at what are the data and information systems in place now there's formal IT information technology data systems and there's other information there's static information and data there's dynamic information and data and either the system or systems in place are conducive to the needs of the processes or they are not. And that's what you need to uncover. Um, what about the materials and supplies? Are the, are the materials and supplies uh, not good enough so that there's a lot of rework that's caused in our process because some of the inputs that we're using, some of the materials and supplies are deficient and we're not catching that before we start using it, creating scrap and rework, etc. What about the tools and equipment? Are all the uh, saws sharp enough to borrow somebody else's phrase? Um, do we have what we really need? Do we have an adequate uh, capacity or are, are the is the equipment experiencing too much downtime and that's what's really messing up the process and etc so we need to be able to look at that we need to look at what the facilities and grounds are I mean if we have to keep things at a temperature control uh, to uh, uh, keep its quality at the levels that are required if we have problems with the air conditioning and heating systems that could be uh, problematic then for our output uh, because our facilities and grounds are not conducive to the needs of the process. And this is what it's all about. Is everything conducive to the needs of the process? Do we have the right budget for our materials and supplies, for our headcount, for if we have more work and we have overflow work and we bring in temps to help us? Either we have budget and headcount sufficient to the needs of the process or we do not. And again, we need to look at the culture. Is the culture that's in place organizational entity by organizational entity, process by process, is that conducive to the needs of the process? Again, so we can look at all of these variables and all the sources that impact the variables of process performance to see where does the root cause lie? And it probably lies in more than one place. Uh, and if we think about this in a Pareto principle uh, perspective, then you know we might be able to get 80% of the benefits from addressing 20% of the root causes. So it's something that needs to be looked at and then tested uh, before you walk away and think you're done because you've uh, addressed some of those variables. Um, and just because you've addressed something doesn't mean that there won't be some backsliding. Does it stick? Same thing with training. People could learn it 
and then because others are uncomfortable with the way a guy who's been recently trained in a new approach to this thing, they could be extinguishing my new knowledge and skills, my new behaviors, because management's not comfortable with that, because that's not how they learned it, they don't even know how to manage it anymore, or my peers are uncomfortable with it, and they inhibit me from continuing to apply what I've learned. Um, it's always complex. Now, when we look at the human enablers, we need to look at, so what are those human enabling systems that are provisioning the right people to do the right thing at the right time within the process? And sometimes we need to look at the job design or the organization design itself to see, is it conducive to the needs of the process? Uh, we might want to look at our staffing and succession planning systems to make sure that we're always grooming people to be at the ready to step up to take the next job or to step sideways to take a job elsewhere depending on where uh, growth is predicted or shrinkage in volume of work and the number of people that are required. Uh, do we have that system in place in our, or are we always trying to catch up to something that could have been predicted but was not? That's sometimes an issue. We need to look at our recruiting and selection systems and try to minimize the burden then on training and development by hiring the right people that have enough of what we need and minimize the training and development costs. Um, sometimes that's the ideal thing to do, sometimes that's just not practical. And so you have to understand the reality that the context that you're existing in, the greater context beyond your own performance context, there's an environmental context of the markets and the places where your operations happen. So you need to be able to take a look at that. Uh, the instructional development and deployment systems, the training and development systems, the learning and development systems, are they producing good instructional content? Uh, which, in my view, instruction includes both standalone job aids for performance guidance and support in the workflow, and then there's training. And are we res uh, reserving training and training time for when we need people to actually memorize things and or hone certain key critical skills? Or would a job aid or uh, standard operating procedures or quick reference guides or uh, electronic performance support systems, would that have been sufficient in order to positively affect performance of the processes? We don't need to train everybody on everything. Uh, first of all, they're not going to memorize it and have it at the ready when it's needed and we may need to augment the person's uh, conscious knowledge um, and non-conscious knowledge with some guidance. And so instructional development and, and deployment is not always about training or learning, classroom or virtual or whatever, self-paced, group-paced or coached. We need to take advantage of the right mix of all of those things and various media to meet the needs of the people in the process. Um, again, is it conducive to the needs of the process? Yes or no is the answer. Uh, we can look at the performance appraisal and management systems so we can appraise people's performance and then manage their performance. Now, that's all taken on a very negative connotation because, like many things, uh, we screw them up. That's a technical term or phrase. Um, but performance management should be about looking at the needs of the process, looking at the individual performers or team, and determining what are the mechanisms that we can use to improve the situation. Not necessarily to punish people, unless they're way out of line, um, but how to help them grow and develop to become valued contributors to the process. And that's what performance management should be all about. And performance appraisal should be uh, unique and reflective of the demands of the process and not some arbitrary set of appraisal dimensions that are fit everybody but then no one in particular. Um, th those need to be tailored to what are the processes and what do they demand of people and can we assess people against those demands and not some set of universal truths of which the only universal truth I found in my 41 year career is that there are no universal truths. So uh, have a Zen moment with that. 
We can also begin to look at the compensation and benefits. We could have a lot of turnover because we're simply not uh, compensating people or providing them with the benefits packages because uh, th we're in competition with everybody in our geography or elsewhere in a gl global sense uh, where people may pick up and leave because somebody's offering them a better deal. Now, not everybody would leave a good boss and a good culture for better compensation and benefits. So we need to take a look at what are the needs of the people and what are uh, their expectations and what would be of value to them. We shouldn't be so presumptuous that we can provide a standard package to everybody um, and that that should be sufficient. People are different. They have different needs. We need to see if we can have more flexible compensation and benefits uh, packages to meet the people's needs as well as various flexible reward and recognition packages. Uh, whereas some people may want more money, some people might want an extra half a day off instead as a reward for their good performance. Uh, the last thing that we should do is reward good performance with more performance requirements, more work. Uh, we tend to do that where we tend to give our best workers even more work than our poor workers and that's just not fair and you know they know it. So again here's a model. Um, what's critical in this is that um, I've got a bunch of labels, language that I use to describe these things but most likely most of the organizational entities in your enterprise that provision the right environmental things and the right people uh, uh, things support to the processes are going to be named differently. So one of your first tasks is to figure out, well, what are these things called in my organization? And is there a centralized group that owns all of it? Or is it all decentralized and it's all over the place? Or is it a blend? Are people doing their own thing for organization and job design with a little bit of guidance from human resources? You've got to figure that out and you've got to figure out whatever you've discovered is that true across the entire enterprise or is that true in some pockets but not in others? Again, processes are complex, organizations are complex, and it's a mistake to think that once you've made a discovery that that's true across the board. Most often it's not. And again, my advice is adapt what you can, uh, excuse me, adopt what you can and adapt the rest. Um, don't use my language if it's going to get in your way. If there's no language in your enterprise for some of these things, then feel free to use it and take feedback from others if they feel uncomfortable with it and would like to call it something else. Speak in the language of your business and not in the jargon language of our field, uh, our profession, or of Guy Wallace. My additional advice is always go for performance. My website has many free blog posts and resources covering this. You'll find uh, over 500 different free resources uh, and that can be challenging itself. But uh, you can search my entire website using keywords, whatever you've heard from me using here. You know, I'm speaking in my language. Um, and you'll find things there and uh, uh, best of luck to you as you go forth. I also have a book uh, that's for sale. It's available as a Kindle and a paperback, and it's from Training to Performance Improvement Consulting. And it's really all about going from training to performance-based training to get ready for doing performance improvement consulting because you've learned how to take a performance orientation to training, which too often isn't the case. Too often training organizations, learning and development functions, focus on a bunch of topics and not on the tasks and the outputs and the stakeholder requirements. Before you jump into performance improvement consulting, you better have your act together in doing performance-based training or performance-based learning or performance-based instruction or whatever you feel a need to call it. Again, speak in a language that's comfortable for in your context, uh, not necessarily using mine. Here's my website, uh, www.epic.biz and uh, feel free to uh, peruse it and uh, if you are looking for something in particular and can't really find it then email me you'll find my email address all over the site anyway thank you for listening <laughs>